the purpose of this mini lecture is to explain how binomial option pricing works when we use trees. What we're going to be using is a tree diagram, like you've seen in other applications, but what we're going to do is use it to value the stock in the future and then use that in a backwards manner to value a call option. And this is a popular way to value options and is a good way to understand what goes on in terms of the different ingredients in an option, what affects the value. Now, binomial option pricing, what we're going to do here is consider that, just as the name implies, that only two things can happen. In this case, we're going to say the stock price can go up or it can go down. And this way we can simplify what's going on and so you get to the heart of really how an option is valued. We're going to be drawing a tree diagram and working our way through it numerically, both forward and then backward, to value an option. The tree diagram, in this case, is going to look at the value of stock in two different periods, and then we're going to use it going backwards to figure out a value today of the corresponding call option. The process of going backwards in the tree is called backward induction. And we use this not just to value call options, but for example, in valuing a bond that has an embedded option, like a callable bond, <coughs> or a convertible bond, or a puttable bond, any security with an embedded option, this is a useful device in looking at the value of that um, additional option. So we're going to be looking at stock price movements, that is the price can go up or down, and that's key to the value of the option. And then in your later coursework you'll be looking at how you use this as a tool to come up with a value of a, say, a callable bond or quotable bond or convertible bond. You can also use this in capital budgeting when you're talking about options. All capital projects have options. We call these real options because they're options on real assets. Options such as abandonment. So we can start a project and we have an option to abandon it after a year or so or we can have an option to expand a project. So maybe it's a new product and we decide to expand geographically and so forth and we want to expand production capabilities. Those are all options and we can use these trees to value some of those options. So what we're going to do is consider a simple call option, which is the easiest way to illustrate this. The exercise price of this call option that we're going to use is $25 and the current price is $20. So in other words, the option is out of the money. The only way that the option is going to have some value is if that stock price goes above the exercise price of 25. So if the price is 26 or 27, 28, 30, then the option will have value. If it is the stock price turns out to be 19 or 18, then it's not going to have value. We're going to make some assumptions here. The continuous compounded risk-free rate is 5%. That's how we're going to move through time. So we're going to transform values from one period to another by using the risk-free rate of 5%. We're also going to make an assumption about the percentage change in a stock's price if it goes up, this being 60%, and the percentage change in the stock price if it goes down is 40%. Now, those are pretty dramatic numbers but we want to make sure that you see the numbers and how clear they are. So by using the dramatic numbers, we can uh, illustrate this a little bit easier. So the process we're going to do is we're going to calculate stock prices in each node of the tree, and we're going to go into two periods here. We could expand this to more periods, but we're just going to simply look at two periods here. Once we get the stock prices, at the end of two periods, we're going to value the call option and use the call option valuation at that point and then bring that back into the present. Now, 
when we bring it to the present, we have two things we have to worry about. One is probability, because there's a probability the price go up, price probability the price go down. So we have to weight things by the probabilities, and we have to uh, discount if we're going to move between periods. So we'll have to do some discounting. And we'll do this in each period. So we'll wait by probabilities and discount. Now the probability of an up movement is based on a random walk. And that's why we get this um, strange looking formula here. But it is based on a random walk. And we use the risk-free rate of interest, R, which is really 1 plus that. So if R is, you know, if the rate is 5%, R in this formula is 1.05. D is 1 plus the percentage change in a down movement. U is 1 plus the percentage change in the up movement. And this will come up with a probability. And this is based on a random walk. That is a non-predictable pattern. So this is the probability that we'll be using in our weighting scheme here. When we apply the numbers, the 5% risk-free rate, so R is 1.05, U is 1.6 because we have 60% movement if in the up market, so 1 plus that is the 1.6. The D is 1 plus the negative 40% or 0.6. Therefore, we get a probability of 0.45. Therefore, the complement of that is the 55 percent. And these are the probabilities that we're going to be using for the moving up and moving down in the tree. So when we move <coughs> prices go up, we start with the current price of $20 and multiply it by 1.6 we get 32. If we take the $20 and multiply it by 0 0.6 which is 1 minus 0.4, we get 12. So it goes up, it's 32, goes down, it's 12. And that's very straightforward first period. What we're going to do, though, is carry that forward in another period as well. So this is the first period movement, and then we'll also carry it forward uh, one more period. So this is what it looks like in the tree. We've got the up movement for period 1, so we've got the 20 times the 1.6, the 32. Down movement is the 20 times 0.6, it's the 12 that we just saw. Now carrying it out one more period, we're going to have the 32 applied against the 1.6 and then applied against the 0.6. So if you had, the way we describe these is up, 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 down, and then we have down, up, down, down. And so we end up with four possible prices in two periods. Remember, this is a binomial tree, so it can either go up or go down in any given period. We've got two periods, so we end up with four possible stock prices. Now, in order to say what the call option is worth, we have to compare the price that we predict at the end of two periods with the call price. Now, stepping back a few slides and we have current price of 20 and we have an exercise price of 25. So it's the, in order for the call option to be valuable, then the price must be above 25. So if we go back to our tree, there's only one stock price that's above the 25 and that is the 51.2. All the rest would be out of the money and we, we wouldn't exercise the call option. So we basically end up with a value of the call option of 26.2 in two periods under one of the probability states. Remember there are four different things that can happen here. Up, 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 down, down, up, and down, down. And only one of these scenarios is the call option valuable. Now we put it together with some other pieces and we in discount it, and we weight it by the probability. So we weight the 26.2 by the 45% probability, that the P that we calculated earlier, multiply the zero value of the call option by 1 minus P, 
So that's a weighted average. And then we discount by 5%. We're discounting one period of 5%, so we divide by 1.05. That gives us a value of the call option of 11.2286. Now it's real easy in the down scenario because the call option has zero value there. If it had some value, then of course we would insert those values in the formula. So we end up with zero in that case. Now when we bring it back one more time, one more year, we again weight it by the probability of up, probability of down, and we discount it by 1.05 of the 5%. So we have a value of the call option of 4 and 81. So that's the value of the call option today. So this was the backwardization move from the 26.2000 down to 4.81. Now let's think of another option. So let's see, we have, suppose we have a price of the underlying, the 50. So that's today's price. The exercise price, or strike price, is 60 on the option. The call option is exercisable in two years. Assume that the risk-free rate is 1% and the price change in either period is 30% up or down. So instead of the 60 and 40 that we had before, we now have 30% up or down. So we calculate the probability. It's a little messier. It's 51.667 for a probability. So R is 1.01, U is 1.3, D is 0.7. So remember this is symmetric now. 30% up or 30% down. When we value the stock, moving upward, yeah, up, 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 down, down, up, and down, down. These are the different values that we get in the second period of the price. Now we value the call option. Remember, exercise at 60, we end up with 24 and a half for the call option, zero in all other scenarios. It doesn't always happen that way. But then we wait by the probability. Remember that's 51.667, and then the complement that is one minus that. And then we end up with a value of the call option of $6.41. And if this were a put option instead with an exercise price of 60, then we've got a different scenario because this gives us an option to sell it at 60. And if it's below that, that would be attractive. So we take the same stock price scenario and we work differently in terms of the valuation and we'd end up with something, we'd end up with more value here and we'd have to basically say it's in the money in scenario two, three, and four. It's out of the money scenario one, and then we'd work it back in the probabilities as such. And that's it, binomial option pricing.